Hello and welcome to my channel. My name is Venus and today I'm going over all of the books that I read in the month of May. I read 10 books ranging from two stars to 4.5 stars. It was a it was a pretty good overall month. I did not have any DNFs. I actually haven't had any DNFs in a couple months, so that's always a good thing. As always, I start from my least favorite and work my way up to my favorite book of the month, and we're just gonna get right into it. My least favorite book for the month of May was The House That Horror Built by Christina Henry. This was one of my most anticipated reads of 2024, and I was so disappointed after reading this book. Near the Bone, one of her other books, is one of my favorite horror books of all time, and this is the second book that I read by her, and I was extremely bored. It was not even like it was written by the same author. So in this book, we are following Harry. She short for Henrietta, I think. She is a single mom, so let's start right there. It is very obvious she's a single mother because it is mentioned a million times. It becomes very annoying. She is a, si a struggling single mother that is mentioned over and over again. So that irritated me right away. So this single mother is working for a famous horror movie director who has become a bit of a recluse because he had something tragic happen in his family. So he just stays in his gothic Chicago mansion that is full of like horror movie props from all different kinds of movies, including his. And that was probably the coolest thing about this book is kind of going through the house as Harry. She works for him as a cleaner. All of his props and just, he kind of follows her around too while she's doing it, so it's kind of odd. This book also takes place during the pandemic, which I feel like was unnecessary. It was just, you know, masks were mentioned multiple times. It just didn't really add to the story, so I don't think that it was needed. So as you're following Harry cleaning through this house, she starts hearing voices behind a door from a room that she's not allowed to go into. She is also feeling like the masks from some of these props are, are watching her. This felt like, and it's so crazy, I was reading it and I was like, why does this feel like a really bad version of The Haunted Mask? Goosebumps book by R.L. Stein. It, I was like, man, this is, this is really reminiscent of The Haunted Mask, but like in a bad way, in a really bad way. And it, I looked at, so when I read books, sometimes I like to look at other people's reviews, especially if I hated the book. And that, I'm not the only person that thought that. I thought that was funny. And then I also saw Gabby from Gabby Reads review on this book, and she literally said the same thing. But it, it really is like a bad version of The Haunted Mask. It is so slow. It is so boring. We concentrate a lot, like I said, on her being a single mother to her son. The son, honestly, was the funniest and most smartest character in this book. When you find out like what happened to this director and his family, it's not all that shocking. The ending was very predictable and just boring. It was just a very disappointing read for me, so that is my least favorite book of May. My next least favorite book for the month of May was Listen for the Lie by Amy Tintera. I'm giving this 2.5 stars. I did do a reading vlog about this, but overall it was not enjoyable to me at all. Mainly because there is an amnesia trope in this that is not my favorite. I actually don't like amnesia tropes at all. You can guess what's gonna happen um, very early on in this. So in this book we are following Lucy and she lives in a small town and when she was younger, I guess maybe, I don't even think it was, she was younger. I think she was like in her 20s when her friend Savvy um, is brutally murdered and she, Lucy is found kind of walk, walking through the streets all dirty with like blood all over. They could never figure out what happened to Savvy. A lot of people in the town accused Lucy of doing the murder, but there was not enough evidence. So Lucy left the town to move to Los Angeles to kind of start over without all of the drama from the uh, murder following her. Five years go by and a podcaster wants to do a true crime about, a true crime podcast about this story and try to figure out what happened to Savannah Savvy. And then also Lucy's grandmother has invited her back to celebrate her 80th birthday but also really just trying to get her back to help this podcaster figure out what happened. And so Lucy goes back. Lucy is a very unreliable character. She's got a snarky, a much rude personality. She likes to make jokes a lot about uh, her being an accused murderer. She likes to make people feel uncomfortable. It gets really corny and irritating <laughs> as you're reading it. And then all of a sudden she becomes, I don't even know what to add. She becomes an even more annoying, but in the opposite way. If you like murder mysteries with a lot of like small town vibes, 
There's a bunch of family drama in this with Lucy and her family and her ex-husband. Amnesia Trope. If you like all these things, this is actually a very popular book right now. You may really love this book. I just didn't enjoy it at all. It was, I thought it was boring. It dragged on and I knew exactly what was going to happen. So that, <laughs> that was not a fun time, but yeah, 2.5 stars. The next book is Bless Your Heart by Lindy Ryan. And this is, I rated this one 3.5 stars. I overall really enjoyed this book. This is like a cozy mystery, but has a lot of elements of horror in it as well. So there's vampires in it. It takes place in a small Texas town in 1999. And we are following four generations that own a funeral parlor. So there's the great the great-grandmother, the grandmother, the mother, and the daughter. So the women in this family, they are keeping a secret. There was a situation with two dead bodies that are buried, I think, in their backyard. Of I'm trying not to give too much away, but it involves a vampire, which they call a sequoi, which is almost like a vampire slash zombie. And so their job is to make sure they kill any of these that may um, come back to life. So the town gossip, um, she ends up dying and they bring her into the funeral home and she comes back to life. So that is when the daughter, the youngest daughter, ends up realizing what the women in her family must do to keep their town safe. And it goes from there. It's a very cute, it's cute. It's funny. It does get gory with some of the deaths, so I definitely enjoyed that. And this is actually a series, and I absolutely plan on reading it. The ending left you on a cliffhanger. Um, it was actually pretty surprising, so I, I thought it was funny. Um, it has that, like, southern charm in it. The only thing, like, my mind couldn't get the character straight because you have the grandmother the great-grandmother, the grandmother, and the mom. And for some reason, I just kept mixing their characters up. But other than that, I thought it was a great, fun read. I actually listened to this book on audiobook through Libby, and it was it was enjoyable. I, I got through it in, like, probably two days. And I absolutely recommend it if you like vampires and, like, kind of cozy mystery-type vibes. But there is horror in this. So, like I said, there some of the scenes do get a little gruesome. But yeah, overall, it was a great time. Next up is Keep It in the Family by John Mars. I also gave this book 3.5 stars. This is definitely a thriller, horror, dark <laughs> book that I overall enjoyed. Uh, it It is very long. I feel like it was close to 500 pages, might even have been over 500 pages. And the final part, so it was broken out into, I think, I think four parts. I feel like after the third part, there was a huge reveal. Anything after that, I was completely bored. Um, so in this book, we are following Mia and Finn, and they are a young couple uh, living with his parents that are absolutely horrible. Well, mostly the mother. The mother-in-law is horrible. And they decide to buy this house and fix it up. It's a mess of a house, but they decide to buy it and fix it up so that they can finally get out of his parents' house. As they're rebuilding it and fixing it up, the um, Mia finds, I can't remember what she said, she finds writing on the wall in the attic and it says, I will save them or something like that. And then they find even darker things that happened up in this attic and it becomes like a whole thing on the news and everything. And Mia becomes obsessed with trying to figure out what happened to these people. Children, children were found in the attic. So she becomes obsessed with trying to figure out what it was. It's kind of pulling her um, marriage apart. In the meantime, she also had a baby right when this was discovered. She was pregnant, had a baby right then. Not right then, <laughs> but right around the same time that this happened. And it's just, this book was crazy. I'm trying not to give too much away. There's a serial killer aspect of it. The family dynamics is insane. And it just was a crazy book. I was really enjoying the first three parts of it. And then all of a sudden, it just dragged on. It dragged on. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm done with this. We get, I like, it's, it, I understand what's happening. Like, why is this still, ha still going on? But other than that, I think it was a great read. I love John Mars writing. He's got crazy ideas that he comes up with, but it's very, it was very enjoyable, except it just needed to be shortened. If you like serial killers and just jacked up families and like domestic horror, then you would probably definitely like this. There's absolutely triggers in it because obviously they found dead children in the attic. So there's some things that are addressed with that, but uh, other otherwise, I thought it was a pretty good read, and like I said, 3.5 stars. Next up is The Paradise Problem by Christina Lauren. I am giving this 3.5 stars. This is a romance book, and in this book, we are following Anna, 
she <laughs> she is a very funny character. She's an I think she's an art graduate, and she ends up marrying Wes, um, who is actually from a very wealthy family that owns a huge grocery store chain. And while they are in college, they end up marrying so that they can apply or get accepted for subsidized housing on the college campus. I, I think that's how that marriage thing started, the fake marriage thing started. And towards the end of the allotted time where they were supposed to get married, they Wes moves out, he moves on with his life, he graduates his college and graduates his he graduates college, and then he realizes there's a clause um, where he is supposed to inherit a whole shit ton of money from his family, but he has to be married for a full five years, and otherwise he forfeits the money. I think that's how the thing went, the clause went, that his grandfather put into place. So he gets back in contact with Anna. So meanwhile, when they were living together during college, they barely saw each other. Like they don't even really know each other. They would come and go and just kind of pass each other. And they basically led separate lives. Now Wes needs to prove that he has been happily married for five years because his sister is getting married and they are having this massive wedding in Singapore and everyone's flying over there. So he has to bring Anna with her. Meanwhile, she is the complete opposite from anyone in his rich, wealthy family. She is like pink hair. She smokes weed. <laughs> I mean, she eats Cheetos. She is just super chill and laid back as opposed to his family who are stuck up in their all jerks. So she has to kind of fake to be like what he needs her to be. Um, and so they go to Singapore. I loved the setting in Singapore. I thought that was written very well. I loved it. This is a perfect summer read. Beautiful beaches, the weather, just all of the vibes for summer reads. Wes's family are very irritating. His father is such an asshole. His mother is so annoying. His sister was okay. And then his, he's got like two brothers. One of them is a jerk and then the other one is just like whatever. He just goes with the flow. Um, so she has to, you know, kind of make like she has been with him for five years and they're happily married and blah, blah, blah. And overall, I enjoyed it. Um, I think the transition from them barely knowing each other to damn near falling in love was just too fast for me. There wasn't a smooth transition with that. I was like, wait, one page, they like barely know each other. And the next page, they're ready to rip each other's clothes off. So that, that just kind of threw me off a little bit. I really did like Anna's character. She was hilarious. This was fun. I mean, I had a fun time with it. Not one of my favorite Christina Lauren books, but I, I think it's worth the read, um, especially, like I said, as a summer romance book. Next up is I'm Afraid You've Got Dragons by Peter S. Spiegel. This is the author of The Last Unicorn. I have not read that book, but I watched that movie so many times when I was younger. So when I heard that he had a new book coming out, I just I just grabbed it because it has dragons in it. So I had to read it and I really enjoyed it. I gave it 3.5 stars. So in this book, we are following Robert, who also has a very long name <laughs> that he was given. <laughs> Uh, his true family name, but we call him Robert in the book. Um, and he is a dragon exterminator. He has inherited this, I guess, business since his father has passed away. And he doesn't like doing it. He's just not connected to it. He would much rather be, I think he, I think it's like a butler. Oh gosh, I can't remember what he, he'd much rather be something else. Oh, I can't remember what it, I'm going to say butler. It's something kind of like that, like an assistant to a prince or a king. I, I, it's dr completely, I cannot think of the word, but we'll, we'll say butler. He would much rather be that than a dragon an exterminator. And then we're also following Princess Cerise, and she is on the hunt for her husband. She's looking, she's interviewing all these different princes. There are like hundreds of princes, princes in this land and they come and she basically interviews them. She asks them questions and then she shoes them away when she doesn't like them. But she finally finds one, Prince Reginald. She finds him and she just becomes enamored with him. And so while she's trying to get her castle ready to host Prince Reginald, she finds out that it's infested with dragons. So in this world, dragons can be as small as a mouse or as big as what we think of dragons. And it's funny. I did laugh a couple times reading this, but Robert has to come to the castle and exterminate all of these dragons that are just living in the walls and minding their business. I mean, there's like hundreds, might even be thousands of them 
that he has to get rid of. And it just pains him. He like doesn't like doing it. He doesn't like killing them. None of the drag, like you won't, if you're like looking for a dragon book where dragons like talk and there's like actual dragon characters, that's really not what this is. It's mostly Robert coming into his own and figuring out what he is meant to be. And they go on a quest to try to figure out why there's these specific types of dragons that have never been heard of before. Because Robert knows all kinds of dragons. His father taught him about all of the different kinds of dragons. And they find, um, when he's killing dragons, they find a species, I'll say, that he's never seen before. So he's like, I think someone is making dragons. And so it goes on a little journey. This is very much like a fairy tale with the princess and the prince and then Robert coming into his own, figuring out what he is meant to be. And I I had a good time with it. I feel like it, it ended very abruptly. Like you find out Robert's destiny and then happy ever after. And I'm like, no, I want to know more. Like, what happens now? What does Robert do now that he, he knows this? And yeah, I, I was bummed out about the ending, but overall, I had a great time with it. Robert also has two, like, best friends that you have as characters in this as well that I, I like too. So this was very cute and cozy and very fairy tale-ish and written very well. It's funny. And yeah, I had a great time with it. So I definitely recommend it. Next up is Heartless Hunter by Kristen Cicerelli. This is the first book in the Crimson Moth series. I think it might be a duology. I'm not sure. But this is the first book. And overall, I enjoyed it. I gave it four stars. So in this, we are following a witch and a witch hunter. In this world, originally, witches were kind of ruling everything, was running everything. And then humans took over and started killing all the witches, uh, hence the witch hunters. And while um, Gideon, who is like the head witch hunter, he is out trying to basically extinguish all of the witches that are left. We also have Rune, who is the crimson moth. She is a witch, but nobody knows that she's a witch except for her two best friends. And she's on a mission to save all of the witches that are left in this kingdom. And so, of course, there is Enemies to Lovers. This is a romance fantasy book. And it, it was a fun time. I had a great time with it. She um, will take out anybody that's in her way as she's trying to rescue the witches. So she leaves, like, death and destruction in her path. <laughs> and Gideon is trying to figure out who the Crimson Moth is. So he has no idea that it's Rune. And you follow that storyline. There was like kind of a little love triangle that I didn't really love too much. I don't typically like love triangles, but it was resolved pretty quickly. Hopefully, I feel like. One thing I didn't really like is so in order for Rune to use magic, she has to get a specific type of blood, I'll say. Um, and this type of blood grossed me out. <laughs> I just wish that it was anything else but that. It was like weird when, when we got to the part of how she has to collect the blood. I'm like, wait, is that what I think it is? And yeah, yeah, it was. And no, no, I didn't like that. I didn't like that at all. I don't need those visuals. So outside of that, um, it was okay. I don't, I didn't love the characters that much but the storyline kept me entertained the ending was great i am very much looking forward to seeing where it goes um it was kind of a sad ending so yeah i mean overall it's probably more of a 3.5 but i'm gonna say four stars i'll say four stars my journal says four stars but as i'm talking about it it's more of a 3.5 <laughs> but either way it'll get rounded up on goodreads so i think it's worth it if you're into rom romance fantasy but yeah, just be on the lookout for the weird blood situation because that was gross. Next up is First Lie Wins by Ashley Elson. I gave this book four stars. I also did this in that thriller reading vlog. I will link below. I had a great time with this book. This was the perfect thriller for me. We are following Evie Porter. She is a con artist hired by Mr. Smith and he has given her a job to get close to Ryan and she ends up getting so close to him that she has moved into his house. And then you start getting flashbacks of Evie's past and how she got to where she is now and 
things start unfolding and it is a fun ride. I promise you, if you like like con artists, quick chapters and the stakes were high, I felt like the stakes were high. It was suspenseful. You think it's going one way, but it goes another way for me. I mean, some people, maybe you can guess what's happening in this, but I certainly didn't. And I had a great time with it. It was so good. And I can see why it's a Reese's Book Club um, pick. And I definitely recommend it if you like thrillers. But if you're not into like the con artist side of it, like if you don't like that like underground, her being given a mission and her having to, Evie, having to like finish the mission or something might happen to her with someone behind the scenes like the Wizard of Oz <laughs> pulling strings and you don't know who they are until the end, then you might not like this. But if that sounds like something you would enjoy, then I definitely recommend this. Then we have The Idea of You by Robin Lee. I loved this book so much. I'm giving it 4.5 stars. This is also a movie that I enjoyed overall, but the book was definitely better. Oh, this book was so good. So I think I enjoyed it because I used to absolutely love boy bands when I was younger. I went to all the concerts, I did backstage, like meet and greets, like all the things. So in this book, we are following a mom of a teenager who got tickets to go to a concert and has a meet and greet pass and they are backstage and her daughter is like all excited uh, about meeting the band and it's like a boy band. And Solen, who is Isabel, Isabel's a daughter, Isabel's mom, Solen, ends up catching the eye of Hayes Campbell, the lead singer in this like British pop band. And sparks fly and she ends up like meeting him and going on dates and she is also 20 years older than him. He's 20 and she's like in her either just turned 40 or like early 40s. So huge age gap and it just goes from all of the different cities he's traveling in and all of the drama that comes along with dating a pop star and her trying to hide it from her daughter who is obsessed with the group and her ex-husband getting all crazy once things are discovered and it is just a fun romance swoon worthy heartbreaking <laughs> fun time. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I think the author did a really good job of really making you understand like what it's like to be behind the scenes of a boy band and the paparazzi and all the things that they have to go through. And then as a mom who has a daughter, like how do you reconcile that? How do you even like and then there's a 20 year 20 year age gap. It's it's a whole thing and it's messy. But it was a good time. I had a good time reading this book. There is one line that Hayes says at one point, because of course there's going to be like drama and they're going to argue and she constantly says how much older she is. And there's this one line where he texts her and it says, open your door. And I was like, oh my God. I don't want to say any more than that. Like what part that is. I literally just got goosebumps. <laughs> but I love this book. I thought it was great. The ending broke my heart, but anyway, it was still a great read. And the movie compared to it, I think the book was much more sexy. Solen was more, I don't know, she was very much more comfortable with herself and the situation. Not saying that Anne Hathaway didn't do a good job. I think she did a great job. She's gorgeous. But the Ah, so Len in the book was just, I just loved her so much more. The only reason this was not five stars is because Solen is an art dealer, um, an art collector, and the author spent a lot of time talking about art and her love of art and art collecting and art selling, and it was just too much. Go, let's get back to Hayes. Let's get back to Hayes. Uh, I don't care about the art. So that's the only reason why I didn't give it five stars. But I love this book. I would definitely reread it. I mean, this thing is like, I have this spine broken. I was, I was reading this late into the night. I loved it. So I highly recommend it if you like romance and I've ever liked boy bands. And my favorite book for the month of May is If Something Happens to Me by Alex Finlay. This was also in the thriller vlog that I did. I loved this thriller. Alex Finlay is a new auto buy author for me. I will read anything that he puts out. He is also the kind of thriller writer that I absolutely eat up. There is fast pace action going on. There was a mobster point of view in this. There was overseas travel to Italy and France and London. I mean, it was just so many things going on that I 
100% enjoyed. So in this book, we are following Ryan. It opens up with him and his girlfriend. I think her name is Allison. And they are kind of celebrating the end of their senior year. They're at this like lover's lookout point like in the woods somewhere. Right as it starts raining, they try to run to the car. Ryan gets knocked out over the head. Passed out cold, and Allison is missing. Her and her car are missing, and they can't find her. She is gone, and Ryan is looked at as a suspect. So five years go by. He has changed his name. He is in law school, and he is currently vacationing in Italy. And all of a sudden, he gets a note from someone that says, I know who you are, and you need to meet me here. And then in his hometown in Kansas, we are following a sheriff deputy's point of view. And they recently discovered the car um, submerged underwater that was Allison's car. And it has two dead bodies in it, but Allison is not in it. So the deputy has to try to figure out, put the pieces together with that. And then we also have this mobster in Philadelphia. He's got some stuff going on with his son. And then we also follow his account, Michael. And the way that this story comes together and how these characters are intertwined, and the action that happens in this was so good. <laughs> I loved it so much. I could see this as a movie. It is over the top, yes, but I, and the same thing with his last book. I can't remember what it's called, but I loved it. I love these kind of thrillers. I highly recommend it. I wish more people were talking about Alex Finlay. I just want more. I want to read all of his backlist books. And I had a fantastic time. The only reason it's not a five star is because Ryan's point of view is a little draggy for me. But other than that, it was great. I highly recommend it. Highly recommend it <laughs> if you like those kind of thrillers. And that was my May reading month. I think it was pretty good now going back over everything I read. Let me know down below what was your favorite read in the month of May. As always, thank you so much for stopping by and I can't wait to see you again next time. See ya.